Hello and good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the Center for International Policy Studies at the University of Ottawa. My name is Rita Abrahamson. I'm the director of SIPS and it's my great pleasure today to welcome you to the talk Born in Blackness. Before I introduce our guest speaker, we begin as we always do by acknowledging that SIPS is located on the unceded territory of the Algonquin people. And we therefore pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders past, present, and future. Today's talk is part of Black History Month, and I can't really think of any better way to celebrate than to spotlight Howard French's recent book, Born in Blackness. This is a book that um, pretty much tells us to forget everything we know about history or everything we thought we knew about history. And instead, the book places Africa and Africans at the center of the making of the modern world. It's a, book, it's a book that begins in the early 1300s with the unimaginable riches of the African emperor Mansa Musa. It takes us through the slave trade, the sugar and cotton plantations, the Haitian revolution, the American civil war and onwards, all the way showing the centrality of Africa and Africans to the making of the world. It is a book, uh, I must say, with much, much pain and suffering, but it's also a book of pride, of creativity, and a book that showcases the political agency of Africans. Howard French is a career foreign correspondent who worked for the New York Times for many years, and he is currently a professor of journalism at Columbia University. He is the author of five books, including China's Second Continent, how a million migrants are building a new empire in Africa, and also a continent for the taking, the tragedy and hope of Africa. He is, as you probably know, the recipient of many awards for his journalism and, and for his books. And I'm really very, very honored to welcome him to SIPS today. But just before I hand you over to Howard French, uh, let me mention that we are lucky enough that uh, Howard French has agreed to take questions from the audience after he's done his talk. So if you want to post a question, please use the chat box that is right at the bottom of your screen. And then afterwards, I will do my best to get through as many questions as possible. Okay, with that, welcome once again to SIPS and over to you in New York, Howard French. Thank you very much, Rita. Um, good afternoon to everyone. I can't see you all, of course, or maybe you don't know that, but uh, let me just let you <laughs> inform you now uh, as we get underway. I can't unfortunately see you all and would much prefer to have been with you in person. But what I'm going to try to do over the next 35 to 45 minutes is to give you a basic overview of my book and its principal arguments. Um, and to do so, I have to compress quite a bit, uh, but I'm gonna to try to cover some of the most important ideas and highlights. And in that way, uh, hopefully stimulate a rich conversation and provide a kind of foundation for, for, for your questions uh, and, and our engagement to follow. <clears throat> the introduction was, was generous and, and kind, uh, uh, but also, um, uh, um, very precise and 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 accurate. Uh, so much so that uh, Professor Abramson has somehow, uh, some to some extent, stolen my thunder. Um, in the following sense, um, I had planned to say, in fact, forget everything you know about the modern, the making of the modern world, and indeed that is the purpose of the book. Um, uh, and so I think I should begin in the beginning with the story as it is most commonly understood. What does the modern, what is, what do we mean by the modern world? Where did the modern world or its creation commence? Uh, and then to proceed from there. <clears throat> I, I should recognize right from the outset that the word modernity and modern, the words modernity and modernism and hence their derivative, the modern world are terms of uh, great uh, debate uh, and uh, which are open to many, many different types of interpretation within the social scientist sciences. Um, <clears throat> so I should begin, I think, by offering a very precise working definition for what I mean. And what I mean by the making of the modern world uh, flows from what I think is uh, 
uh, a fairly common, perhaps even near universal type of Western education prior to certainly graduate school and maybe even prior to advanced college classes. But what we learn along the way in growing up, especially in secondary school uh, and perhaps early in college, when um, uh, the histories we are taught, um, whether or not they use the word modern world, um, uh, sort of open our awareness to the creation of the thing that I'm calling the modern world in the following way. And so, so this narrative begins <clears throat> with typically a, 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 an obsession in Europe and, and in, uh, particularly in a specific part of Europe, Iberia or the Iberian Peninsula, and more particularly still in Portugal, uh, the smaller of the two nations of Iberia, uh, with discovery. Uh, and this, the, the, the special focus of this obsession with discovery in the 15th century, we are told, was with finding a maritime route to the east, uh, meaning to Asia. And what, the, what the, these Europeans, these Iberians, these Portuguese meant initially, we are told, by Asia, uh, the focus of their obsession was initially with, with uh, what we now know as India, but then subsequently points beyond to the East, uh, including ultimately China and Japan. Um, in the telling of this story, <clears throat> well, there's, there's uh, just to back up a half step. Uh, one, so one particular narrative hovers above all of this, the most famous narrative of the age of discovery, um, so to speak. And that is the narrative that you, uh, many of you will have surmised already of Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus fits within this obsession, this idea of, uh, of desperate, a desperate and, and dedicated search, uh, almost exclusive to all other purposes by the Iberians for a maritime route to the east in a very interesting way. Uh, the, the, the traditional telling of the story, um, uh, which in fact in this aspect is not incorrect, um, has us uh, seeing Christopher Columbus set out west across the Atlantic because of a belief that the earth was round and that thereby he would break, uh, make a breakthrough to the east uh, by reaching Asia going west, which no one had, uh, um, no Iberian had tried prior to his, or succeeded at prior to his time. What's wrong with this narrative? So this narrative, well, okay, let me pause again to say, just add another small note. So in this, this traditional telling of the obsession with Asia and the breakthrough of Christopher Columbus, we are, have all been, uh, or almost all of us have been educated to believe and have been beyond narrow education, acculturated to understand that the world came together uh, under a kind of Western aegis. Now, I would argue that the West doesn't really exist yet at this time, meaning in the 15th century, and I'll explain what I mean by that subsequently, but, 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 um, Nonetheless, uh, the world becomes stitched together in a remarkably um, compact period of time as a result of this obsession with maritime discovery of a route to Asia. Okay, so what's wrong with this narrative? What's wrong with this narrative is that <clears throat> as it is told, as this story is told, Africa is all but systematically cut out of the story. This isn't a matter of idle sort of... Um, uh, background. Uh, Africa, we are told, uh, if it is mentioned at all in the normal ways of telling this history that we all begin to encounter in secondary school and perhaps learn more about in college, Africa, if, it, if the word Africa is mentioned at all, Africa is typically mentioned merely as a geographic obstacle that needs to be overcome. The Europeans, we are told, are obsessed simply with finding a way around Africa. Africa, therefore, uh, uh, um, uh, enters into world history for the first time and by no means the last as an inert uh, force or space, a place without inherent interest of its own, a place that must simply be overcome, or it's technically speaking, because we're speaking of na maritime navigation, as I said earlier, circumnavigated. Africa must be, a, a way around Africa must be found. And, Breakthrough consists, well, Columbus cheated by going west, but breakthrough for the Portuguese subsequently, according to the traditional narrative, begins when the Portuguese enter into the Indian Ocean for the first time, and then from 
from there at the Cape of Good Hope, um, then uh, make a, a clean shot uh, to the Indian subcontinent and to Calicut. Okay. So why this isn't just a matter of idle background is of particular attention to my story and uh, should help us understand, um, uh, sort of give us a sense um, of the profound ways in which this history has been mistold and the profound, and in this case, the first instance of, of, uh, of what would become a, a, a reflexive way of treating Africa as a, a geography and and realm of cultures and peoples to be uh, to be effaced, to be erased from our narratives, to be lifted out of the uh, out of the chronicles of history. So, how do I justify this claim? In the early parts of my book, as Dr. Abrams um, uh, said to you um, in the introduction, I begin with a story a century, more than a century and a half before Christopher Columbus. Uh, in the very early years of the opening years of the 14th century, meaning in the very beginning of the 1300s, uh, there are a variety of geopolitical gambits by important leaders of an important empire in the Sahel region of West Africa, which we know as Mali. Mali is the successor in that time was the successor of a much older empire called Ghana. Uh, this part of Africa had been the center of, of uh, sophisticated civilizations and achievement for quite some time had long been the source of uh, uh, tremendous supplies of gold uh, across the Mediterranean, first across the Sahara and then across the, the Mediterranean into Europe. Um, but in the thir early 1300s, two leaders of this empire of Mali make successive bids to break out of a, a kind of geopolitical stranglehold that they're empire suffered from. Malian gold, as I said, from the time of the, pr the pr previous empire, Ghana had transited the Sahara and crossed into Europe. And in doing so, it had changed hands many times. Most importantly, it had been traded through middlemen in uh, various North African kingdoms, the Almoravids, the Amohads, and various others. And in trading uh, through middlemen, the Malians were losing a significant portion of the value of their primary resource, meaning gold, this precious metal, which is really at the heart of the story of so much of civilization in this period, like in other periods in, in world history. So in the beginning years of the 1300s, um, um, the emperor who uh, Dr. Abrams mentioned, Mansa Musa, um, his predecessor, a man named Abu Bakr II, we believe, and we have documentary, documentary reason to believe, um, undertook two ventures, two expeditions uh, to try to discover a world on the other side of the Atlantic. Again, this is more than a century and a half before Columbus. And Abu Bakr II uh, 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 launched or sponsored um, a, um, a maritime venture by a large fleet of boats. I'm calling them boats deliberately. These were not tall masted ships. Tall masted ships were not part of this, the culture of ocean going in West Africa in this era at all. And so we would be talking about this in effect, large dugouts, uh, much bigger than a dugout you would imagine today, but, but dugouts nonetheless. And so Abu Bakr II uh, uh, commissions a voyage to try to cross the Atlantic a century and a half before Columbus. He, the, the only one or a very small number of the people who went out on, on that mission returned. Uh, the head of the mission returns as a survivor, recounts to Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr II that at a certain point, the seas became very violent and all of the boats disappeared save for one or two. Uh, and that the seas in particular converged from different directions at a certain point and therefore were very violent. This is really interesting for important uh, reasons that go to the history of navigation. If this really happened, this person is providing a very accurate description of ocean currents and specifically the canary current system that Columbus would use to discover the Americas himself and which was prior to Columbus, a source of great confusion and fear on the part of Europeans who also feared the violence of the ocean at a certain point, at a certain latitude uh, in the Atlantic. Anyway, Abu Bakr II 
this first uh, Malian emperor, emperor who, we, who we are discussing today, then um, uh, doubles down and says that he himself will try to go out on an even larger expedition. And he commissions um, uh, hundreds of boats, we are told, um, and he never returns. Uh, so what this likely means, if this voyage happened, Abu Bakr II himself died at sea. Uh, and now to how we know this. So we know this because of the emperor that uh, Dr. Abramson mentioned, um, Mansa Musa, who was a successor of Abu Bakr II, who in 1324 undertakes one of the most um, uh, stunning and I would say historically important um, gambits in the history of the late Middle Ages. Um, um, Mansa Musa sets off by camelback on pilgrimage to Mecca, stopping off in Cairo along the way. And he does so at the head of an extraordinarily large procession, traveling 3,500 miles across the Sahara and carrying in uh, the packs on his uh, camels, 18 tons of gold, pure gold, mostly in the form of gold powder, but also uh, in um, to some extent in, in the form of of bars of gold. And Ab I'm sorry, I wanted to say Abu Bakr. Mansa Musa then begins to distribute uh, this gold in acts of patronage and religious devotion all along the way to people high and low uh, in, crossing the Sahara and then especially in Cairo itself and ultimately in Mecca to the extent that the normal traditional ratio of the value of gold to silver, which we have seen uh, in most parts of the world in most ages, whereby gold is an order of magnitude order of magnitude more expensive than silver, reverses. The abundance of gold on the marketplaces of the Middle East or of the Mediterranean world more broadly plummets because of uh, Mansa Musa's largesse. And word spreads into Europe very quickly as a result of this. Gold prices are depressed for, for a decade or more. And Europeans eventually get wind of this. Actually, it doesn't take very long for them to get wind of this. And maps start to be drawn initially quite speculatively, but ultimately with more and more detail, um, mostly principally drawing from accounts of traders, typically speaking, Jewish traders on the northern margins of the Sahara Desert, who, because they are people of the book, had been allowed to live uh, and trade in North Africa in this era, and therefore had a kind of what we might call intelligence about the world that existed on the other side of the Sahara and the sources of this gold. And so <clears throat> as a result of geopolitical gambits, this is quite important given the way the narrative has, is traditionally shaped of an inert Africa, an Africa without ambition, and an Africa without agency, an Africa without achievement. And in an Africa that it doesn't isn't a player, isn't a significant force in world history, right away begins to fall apart. These two grand bids by Af by by successive leaders of Mali are are above all geopolitical in scope. They are trying to overcome Mali's um, uh, um, uh, um, economic disadvantage, suffering at the hands of middlemen in North Africa and trying to diversify sources of trade with other parts of the world. In the first case, hoping to discover land or, and life on the other side of the Atlantic. And in the second case, trying to make connection with the Mamluk empire, which presently ruled in Egypt. Okay, so um, if we need to fast forward a little bit, I have to compress and I, you'll find me compressing at several points of this narrative. We have to fast forward into the following century when in the opening decades of the 15th century, a, the, the third in line to the crown of uh, one of uh, the most recent and weakest kingdoms in Europe, the Aviz dynasty of Portugal, fixates on the idea of discovering um, the source of Malian wealth as a way of launching Portugal, historically speaking, of allowing Portugal, this young, fragile, and poor kingdom of the Aviz dynasty to get onto its feet, so to speak, um, uh, economically speaking and politically, so that it could resist an attempt uh, to take it over by Spain. I'm calling it Spain. Spain did not, of course, exist in this period, 
uh, for simplicity's sake, instead of speaking of the of the separate the various kingdoms of Spain, I'm just going to call it Spain. So the Avis are trying desperately to resist reabsorption by Spain, and they fixate on connecting with West Africa, with Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is the ab the absolute opposite of this notion of Africa as an obstacle that needs to be overcome, that it needs to be circumnavigated, an Africa without agency or without ambition or achievement. Um, uh, Henry the Navigator then begins to commission a series of voyages down the West African coast in the, in the sort of uh, early mid 15th century. Uh, these initially are proceeding quite slow. Portuguese navigational techniques are not great. Uh, Portuguese uh, 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 understanding of the ocean is not great. Uh, and Portuguese um, uh, thinking is rather superstitious. Um, uh, you will all be familiar with the notion that Europeans believed that the earth was, was flat still at this time and that things like uh, you'll fall off the edge if you go too far or there are dragons that exist somewhere out uh, far in, out, out at sea. And another quite important one, and that is that uh, this is sort of less familiar perhaps to this audience, but that the closer you get to the equator, the more uh, uh, insufferable the, the temperature becomes to the point where if one were to reach the equator, literally metals would melt. It would be become hellish in terms of um, uh, temperature, unsurvivable. And so against these superstitions, Henry the Navigator commissions his own series of voyages. They inch their way down the West African coast. Important things happen before the next stage that I'm going to mention, but for time's sake, I can't really get into it. And the, 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 the the, the specific event that I'm talking about is that the Portuguese, being as poor as they were, it had to, um, uh, these, these voyages were costly to them. Even though they were small in scale, they, the cost was considerable for the size of their budget. And so uh, in, in, in sort of during Henry the Navigator's lifetime, the Portuguese begin to experiment for the first time directly in a trade in, or uh, trades a a, 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 a word worth deconstructing or, or complicating here. Let's say a commerce in um, uh, human beings. The Portuguese in this period, prior to the discovery of the gold that they were seeking, begin to try to capture wandering, isolated groups of, of, of Africans along the coast and uh, embark them onto their vessels and sail them back to Portugal for sale into Europe uh, as enslaved human beings. And the reason, and they didn't really know this at the outset, but they're very quickly discovered a very stout demand for enslaved human beings because Europe was emerging from the after effects of the, of the, of the, the plague. Uh, and there were uh, uh, terrible manpower shortages uh, as a result of the high mortality rates that had been suffered, suffered over the previous decade. And so in a very short period of time, historically speaking, uh, and this is also written out of most conventional accounts of history, including if one were to study history in Portugal or Spain, the two countries most directly affected by what I'm about to mention, in this period, meaning in the middle decades of the 15th century and uh, for the next hundred years or so, uh, the, the, the population of black people in places like Lisbon and Seville in Spain was huge, as much as 10% of the population because of this trade in enslaved Africans. Okay, so in 1471, sometime after the death of Henry the Navigator, uh, uh, po these Portuguese missions arrive in uh, the place, geographically speaking, that we present, we're all presently familiar with as Ghana. And almost right away from their arrival at this location, uh, upon birthing somewhere in a, in, a, in a docile port, they discover that even common people are wearing abundant amounts of gold. And they figure out that this is in fact uh, what they've been looking for all along, that there had to have been enormous amounts, that had to be enormous amounts of gold <clears throat> available nearby. And they set up in, themselves up in trade with the peoples of what I'm going to call Ghana. Ghana, of course, didn't exist as a nation yet, but let's call it Ghana for convenience sake, at a place called Elmina, uh, in order to uh, establish um, this, the, this, this lucrative business that they had been looking for all along. 
the impact of this gold trade, which gets off the ground very quickly between Portugal and, and, and what we're calling Ghana, could not have been more dramatic in terms of world history. What do I mean by this? So this is written out of the traditional accounts, but within less than a decade, the trade from this one spot in gold at Elmina constituted about one third of the entire crown revenue of Portugal. Portugal named its treasury, literally the treasury of Portugal in this period, uh, the House of Guinea. Guinea was a generic name that Portugal had for Africa. And so Portugal's very sustenance, economically speaking, we see is founded in and ref in trade with Africa and specifically with Ghana for gold. Uh, and this is reflected in the name that it ascribes to its treasury, the House of Guinea. This is cut completely out of any narrative that describes Africa as most do as a space to be circumnavigated. Uh, a number of other important things begin to happen. Portugal, uh, hitherto uh, among the weakest and poorest uh, kingdoms in Europe, and also one of the youngest, is suddenly prosperous. Uh, this creates waves of envy in Europe, and especially uh, in next door Spain. I should back up to say something else internally begins to happen in Europe. Uh, the Portuguese initially didn't have a very rich material culture. They didn't have trade goods that the Ghanaians, so to speak, wished to buy from them. They didn't have the military means to impose themselves on the Ghanaians. So all along, it could only have been a question of trade. Uh, and so the Portuguese were forced to scrounge around other parts of Europe to find goods that the Ghanaians would desire. Portugal only had um, cork, dried fish, and salt. Uh, as made major trade goods in this period. And so the Portuguese begin to travel to northern parts of Europe, especially Germany and the so-called low countries to acquire various textiles, but especially worked metal goods, brass and bronze in particular, sometimes iron bars, but especially brass and bronze, which were prized in West Africa, partly because of uh, their relative lack of availability there, but also because they were resistant to corrosion, to rusting in the tropical environment. Okay, so this creates important for the first time economic circuits in helping integrate Europe, economically speaking, between Northern and Southern Europe, which had not existed before and were driven by this, this birth of an extremely prosperous new trade with West Africa. Something else happens. I spoke about the waves of envy. The Spanish set their sights on Spain, Spain being about 10 times bigger than Portugal, set their sights on capturing uh, this um, uh, source of gold trade from, from, from Portugal. Uh, under Queen Isabella, the Spanish send uh, for, for, for the time an enormous fleet off the coast of West Africa, hoping to um, defeat the Portuguese at sea in a naval battle off of West Africa. The Portuguese um, uh, had prior intelligence of this and so lay in wait and uh, ambushed the Spanish. And although being outnumbered uh, and outgunned, the Portuguese prevailed and were able to establish, uh, to, to confirm their hold on the trade in gold with West Africa, subsequently ratified by the Vatican. Uh, the Portuguese begin, build a fort there at Almina, which is uh, still present today, which I invite you all to look for online if you would like to. Uh, principally known um, wrongly uh, as simply, as, as if simply is maybe not the best word, but as essentially a place for trading and enslaved peoples. This fort, this extraordinary fort, the first European art, um, fortified outpost in the tropics was built in 1482 at Elmina uh, for the purpose of trading gold and for the purpose of trading gold only. Um, so, um, something else happens that, that, that can't be skipped over, given that I spoke about Christopher Columbus in the very beginning of my narrative. And that is that Christopher Columbus, whose story we pick up typically in most accounts much later, had worked for several decades um, or a couple of decades prior to his famous discoveries for the Portuguese. Christopher Columbus had worked ferrying this trade in Northern European goods and other supplies back and forth from Europe to Elmina and gold back from Elmina to Portugal. Portu Christopher Columbus, most accounts never mention this, 
what was a ship captain servicing the Portuguese in this early relationship with West Africa. Uh, and Portu Columbus curiously actually wrote about this in his own diaries, but it gets almost no attention in the conventional uh, histories of which I've read quite a few of Columbus, uh, typically never mentioned. Okay, why am I taking the time to specify this? The reason this is important for our understanding of the start of the modern age, if you accept my premise, that this begins with a lust for discovery of Asia and circumnavigating Africa, as the, this being the traditional account, right, is that um, it was Portugal's breakthrough in securing this boondoggle, this enormously lucrative trade with, with Ghana, what I'm calling Ghana, that actually allows Christopher Columbus to make his breakthrough. This, what I mean is, that Christopher Columbus had pre previously already made the rounds for years to various European courts, asking them to fund an, a, a voyage of exploration across the Atlantic to the West in hopes of discovering a new world. And he had been rejected time and again. He went so far as England, trying to get the English to back him, and they had rejected. He had tried with the Spanish, the Spanish had rejected him. But when the Portuguese made this breakthrough at Elmina, the Spanish decided that they had to get into this, ga this game of exploration. And this is when the Spanish re uh, reverse course and provided Portugal, I'm sorry, provided Columbus with the funding he needed to constitute his small fleet and to set off across the Atlantic. Um, there was a bit of geographical thinking behind this. Both Portugal and uh, Spain at this time thought somehow that if gold were so abundant at the latitude that Elmina was, that perhaps the availability of gold in the world would be a, would, would, would be reflected by or be governed by latitude. And so, Port, so Columbus, in setting off for the New World, actually had the idea that if he could explore similar latitudes to the Portuguese in West Africa, he might this would favor the discovery of gold in the New World, which is which is uh, which was at the center of his and of um, uh, Isabel. Uh, um, uh, um, obsessions, if you will. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to fast forward just a little bit to say that to move to the next sort of decisive phase in this history, under the same theory of latitudes, the Portuguese begin to explore uh, very broadly the coast of West and Central Africa, thinking that if gold were available in such abundance in Elmina, then it must be available at similar latitudes on either side of the equator in Africa. So the normal story is that the Europeans, the Iberians especially, are in a race to get to Asia. They're desperate to get to Asia and that Africa is only an obstacle. But what we see when we look carefully at this history is in fact, the Portuguese spend more than two decades completely bound up in exploring the coast of Africa in which they are making no effort whatsoever to get to Asia. They are completely tied up in pursuing this sort of this, um, uh, theory uh, about um, uh, the distribution of precious metals according to latitude. And in the pursuit of this theory, um, uh, they discover an island off the coast of Central Africa called Sao Tome, which is uh, the platform or the backdrop of what I would like to describe to you as the most important economic event of the modern age prior to the Industrial Revolution. So why have you never heard of Sao Tome? Why does Sao Tome never appear in the standard history books? First, I must tell you what the breakthrough was. In Sao Tome, the Portuguese, who had recently begun in other parts of the Atlantic further to the north, experimenting with, with the cultivation of sugarcane, some unknown Portuguese person brought sugarcane seedlings to Sao Tome and planted them there. Sao Tome is an equatorial island almost exactly on the equator, a volcanic island with ex extremely rich soils. And because it's in the equatorial zone, fed by seasonal, heavy seasonal rains, this turns out to be the perfect environment to grow sugar. It is far more fecund and productive than it had ever been in places like uh, Madeira or in the Canary Islands further to the north where the Portuguese had recently been exploring, ex, ex, sorry, experimenting with sugar production. And in Sao Tome, uh, the Portuguese, uh, first of all, discover the fertility of the soil and how appropriate or how um, uh, 
uh, absolute the match between the ecology of the plant and uh, and of the environment uh, were to each other only one thing was missing for them though and the thing that was missing for the portuguese was labor everywhere in the history of the world where port where sugar had been cultivated prior to this and subsequently sugar has been associated with forced labor or enslavement and the reason for that is because sugar is an especially brutal crop to grow. It has to be planted at, uh, in, in dense concentration. Uh, uh, it has to be planted in a very wet tropical environment where diseases flourish. And the sugar plant itself has, uh, it's a type of grass whose leaves are nearly as sharp as, as knives. They're like razor sharp. And so to, to work in the fields of a sugar plantation is to subject oneself to frequent and constant cuts and wounding and in a tropical environment full of disease, infection and early death. Um, and so the Portuguese, after discovering how fertile the land of Sao Tome was, begin to uh, seek supplies of enslaved peoples in various nearby parts of the West African coast. And in a matter of just a few years, the Portuguese um, uh, established in it's near finished form. In other words, in a very mature state, uh, what uh, we know of commonly and which what I wish to persuade you we know of improperly as the plantation. So the plantation as we know it is born in Sao Tome. This is the most important economic invention or innovation or breakthrough in the history of the modern world prior to the industrial revolution. And I'll try to persuade you why that is. But first I need to take on the word um, the word uh, plantation. I would prefer it to be called um, uh, a prison industrial labor camp in which prisoners, imprisoned people, captives, are forced to work at the lash in specialized roles for extremely long and arduous hours under heavy supervision and fed uh, bare subsistence diets on, on the premise that their lives are dispensable, that they can be sourced um, cheaply enough so that it isn't worth trying to husband their health, but rather to eke out as much uh, labor from them as possible during the brief period of life expectancy that one might expect for them. And we can actually measure what this life expectancy was. Uh, typically speaking, and this would be seen time and again in the various other places I'm about to mention in this narrative, but we see for the first time in this period, meaning in the early years of the 16th century as this uh, euphemism, the plantation is being um, uh, um, formulated, um, that the life expectancy of the enslaved person from the moment of arrival in that environment to his or her death is five to seven years. And so, the sugar plantation or prison industrial labor camp is born on Sao Tome in, in, in finished form. And by the way, finished form involves a, another feature which I skipped over um, accidentally just a moment ago. It's a critical, it's a vital element of this finished form. And this feature is called chattel slavery, where you have a class of people who are identified by their race as being the legitimate, the sole legitimate victims of enslavement. And you don't have to guess what the race is. You all know very well that the plantation economy of the modern world, such as we are discussing it in this transatlantic world, starting off in Sao Tome, but about to make the, the leap across the Atlantic, that the human, be, the human population we are talking about is African and that an equation is made, an equivalency is drawn right there in Sao Tome and accepted rapidly in European spheres, blessed by the Vatican and subsequently by other re religious authorities of Africans as being legitimately enslaved. And in fact, the only peoples legitimately enslaved for the purpose of forced labor um, in, uh, initially in the sugar environment. So here we have the prison industrial labor camp uh, in full blossom in the early eight, uh, years of the 1500s. And suddenly, it leaps, as I suggested a moment ago, across the Atlantic by, by virtue of a, another accident, uh, and that is the discovery of Brazil. Brazil was discovered by the Portuguese in this period. 
by tacking, that's a sailing uh, uh, technical term for sailing, uh, involves heading in trying to get from point A to point B, you don't draw a line from those two points, but you, you draw triangles. And so to tack down the coast of West Africa, as the Portuguese were trying to do, not seeking to get to Asia, but seeking to explore Africa, they were sailing out west into the Atlantic and then cutting sharply back east toward Africa, finding that this was a much faster way of getting south along the coast of Africa than simply hugging the coast was. And as they drew these triangles in their navigation, larger and larger, they eventually abutted and discovered Brazil. And so this chattel institution, this prison industrial labor institution um, uh, transits the Atlantic right away in the initial years of the, in the initial decades of the 1500s, the Portuguese try uh, to, uh, without success, to use the available uh, 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 indigenous um, populations in Brazil to cultivate sugar for them. I'm not gonna get into uh, any detail on this, but sugar has, a has an absolutely transformational effect on Europe in this time. It goes in the space of a generation or two from being one of the most lux expensive luxury items in the European diet, only affordable by royalty, to becoming an item of common mass consumption. And this all happens on the back of African labor. Okay, in the initial decades of the 1500s, happens, by the way, on the back of African labor, true tremendous, again, social effect in Europe. And my book gets into this in detail, and it, I'd be happy. It's not just a story of wealth, which of course it was, but of social change driven by Africa and Africans and their labor. Um, and so uh, in the, after an experiment with native Indian populations or American populations in Brazil, uh, which led to mass death, uh, largely because of uh, um, epidemiological reasons, contact with unfamiliar diseases brought by the newcomers. Uh, the Europeans, the Portuguese in specific, begin to bring for the first time uh, large numbers of Africans across the Atlantic to be worked to death in prison industrial labor camps. At the very same time, Spain is experimenting with the same this same new institution in Hispaniola, the island where Haiti and the Dominican Republic are today and were, and in Mexico. Uh, but I'm not gonna focus on the Spanish. I talk about that at great length in my book, but for time's sake, I'm not gonna get into that uh, much here with you now. Um, a number of important things begin to happen very quickly. Uh, before I sort of uh, 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 enumerate them, I have to knock down another myth or another sort of common sort of received notion about the history of the modern age. The most famous stories of wealth acquisition in this era, meaning in the early modern era, I wish I had an audience we could have call and response, I could ask you the question, but I'm pretty confident that the, 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 the most famous story that you all have of the acquisition of wealth by the Europeans involves a group of people that we know of as conquistadors, uh, small bands of valorous Spanish men sort of dressed in armor on horseback who are able against incredibly long odds to conquer uh, great kingdoms in the Native American world. Uh, and as a result of this, who are able to cart back to Europe enormous amounts of gold and silver that they capture from, from these fallen kingdoms. Uh, there are, uh, you know, you, libraries full of books about this and of the Spanish galleons and the galleon trade and the enormous infusion of wealth based on precious metals like these that allowed Spain to get off, a, get on, to become the most important power in this era uh, on, uh, on, on, uh, on the basis of essentially the theft of, um, of, of precious metals from South America or from Mexico. I want to offer to you an, a, a, an alternative understanding, which is documented carefully in my book of what was really happening in this age. And this understanding is that although Spain did indeed profit immensely from gold and silver taken in precisely the way I just described, that there was a bigger, richer, more fecund motor of wealth acquisition at work in Europe in this age. And this bigger, more fecund motor was the prison industrial labor complex. And that Brazil was the site of its first development in the new world, 
under the aegis of the Portuguese, but that this spreads very quickly in a remarkably period, remarkably fast period of time. By 1580 or so, almost no American natives or not in any significant number were any longer working on the plantations of Brazil. It was all Afri African by this point. Um, and in this age already, by this time, Brazil is making more money from sugar than Spain would, be, would make from gold and metal. The gold and metal story, the conquistador story is sexy. It's, it's, it's involves, uh, you know, drama and people who were long considered heroes, so putative heroes and all the rest. But the real economic action was taking place on the so-called plantation. Um, in 1630, we see uh, the next big shift. Again, I'm, I'm moving very fast here. Uh, when the English um, uh, colonize the island of Barbados in the Lesser Antilles, meaning the, the, the southern part of the, the, the West Indies, uh, getting close to the South American continent. The English, this part of the Caribbean, this Caribbean had been dominated by Spain in this era up until this time, but Spain had its handful with, or hands full with big territories. Uh, Mexico and, and part of modern United States uh, in the first instance, but also giant islands in the Caribbean, relatively speaking. Cuba belonged to Spain. Jamaica belonged to Spain. Hispaniola belonged to Spain. So since Spain had its handful with these big spaces, it essentially left smaller spaces in the further reaches of the Caribbean, closer to the South American continent, unoccupied. And the English, very opportunistically seeing this, grabbed hold of Barbados, which, had, which was at that time uninhabited, and seeing how much money the Portuguese had made from sugar in Brazil, imported Portuguese and Dutch. Holland was part of, uh, this gets a little complicated, but Spain, the crowns of Spain and Portugal were fused at this time, uh, and Holland was a colony, so to speak, of Spain. And so an and arrestive colony, a colony that was trying to break free of Spanish rule. And so the English hired um, Dutch sugar farmers who had cut their teeth in Brazil and in actually deliberately imported Africans who had worked in sugar production in the slave industrial complex uh, in Brazil to Barbados. And in an incredibly short period of time, Barbados then takes off uh, as the next uh, um, boom story uh, in uh, wealth creation out of sugar and the and the prison industrial labor uh, system. Uh, how big a how big uh, a source of wealth was this? First of all, Barbados. So in history of the English and British, subsequently the British Empire, Barbados doesn't in the traditional accounts doesn't tend to get a lot of attention. Barbados was the start of it all. Between 1630 and 1700 in an island that is one third the size of the city of Los Angeles in terms of its surface area, England made more money from the exploitation of Africans than the Spanish made in gold and silver from the conquest of their conquistadors. Okay, so the French then, and I'm accelerating here because I wanna leave time for, for questions, but the French watching this also want to get in on the game. And for the same reasons, meaning that the Spanish dominated the big islands of the Caribbean, the French are looking around the Lesser Antilles, they grab hold of, of Guadeloupe and Martinique, and they begin to implement the same techniques, the same institution of prison industrial labor camps and chattel slavery for the pursuit of production of sugar, mostly, but of some other tropical plants also. Coffee, cocoa, tobacco, cotton, these are all being grown in the Caribbean in the margins of the sugar crops by these powers. And uh, France's wealth begins to take off as well. Um, France, um, um, England uh, getting onto its feet, economically speaking, by virtue of the money it had won, it had out of, out of the exploitation of Black people in Barbados, uh, England is able to defeat Spain and take over Jamaica, Jamaica being a much bigger island than, than, than Barbados, uh, pr pr provides a vastly larger platform for the exploitation of these systems and multiplies the income of England and subsequently of Britain and gives it the impetus for the early foundation or formation of 
of, of a kind of industrial, I'm sorry, not industrial, Im imperial approach to the world that we saw uh, uh, in this age in Britain. France is emulating this. The French finally in 1730 begin to um, plant sugar in a big way in, in its part of the island of Hispaniola, meaning uh, the island divided today between Dominican Republic and Haiti. And by the 1780s, so again, we see in a very compressed period of time, an incredible acceleration of wealth creation from almost zero in 1730 until 1780. By 1780, the island of Haiti using the slave industrial, uh, prison industrial labor complex is producing a third of all, is responsible for all, a third of all of France's external trade, that one part of one island, all growing out of this is system of exploitation where people are being imported across the Atlantic for the purposes literally of working them to death within a period of five to seven years. Um, uh, the next remarkable history uh, chapter in this history uh, involves resistance. And if you read my book, you quickly will become aware that resistance, there's resistance at every single phase of this history. There is resistance, there are incredible stories, which I develop in the book, of resistance from the very earliest chapter in the development of these new, new institutions, the slave industrial complex, notably, on Sao Tome, before this system transits the Atlantic and enters into the new world, there had been major slave uprisings on Sao Tome, major um, um, alliances formed between um, uh, so-called maroon populations, meaning runaway slaves who had established an autonomous lifestyle for themselves, for themselves cut off from whites and slaves living on plantations, secret messages and cooperation sent back and forth resulting in gigantic uprisings, which in the case of Sao Tome nearly chased the Portuguese off the island. Okay, so in Haiti and at each subsequent step, there are also very important instances of this sort of revolt and rebellion, which I can't develop in this talk, but in Haiti, we see the his historically speaking, the most important of all of them. In 1791, uh, the enslaved peoples, the enslaved, I should back up. I wanna say, use a word that's in the title of my book, the enslaved Africans in Haiti. They are Africans because they, if people arrive in teen, in at no earlier than teenage for the most part, and they can only live five to seven years under the brutal conditions of labor they are subjected to, they are not um, uh, they are not assimilated into another culture. But by, by the time they die, five to seven years, you're still the person you were when you arrived, culturally speaking, and so. These are people in Haiti who had been drawn from deliberately by whites from different parts of Africa to forestall collusion and cooperation from them and to prevent rebellion. But despite that, in 1791, these Africans rise up and in quick sequence, they defeat uh, the three great imperial forces of the entire modern age in succession. They defeat the French first, the Spanish then said, oh, well, if the French are discouraged and don't think they can control Haiti, we'll try to step in from our side of the island, which we already control. They defeat the Spanish. After defeating the Spanish, the, the British tried to step in and say, we'd like to control this area, of, this zone of slave production. The British sent the largest fleet that they had ever sent across the Atlantic and lost more men than they lost fighting against the Americans in the American Revolution the slaves, the Africans won. After the Africans won against the British, the French came back again under Napoleon and tried to defeat the Africans on the island of Haiti. The Africans won again. Yet again, the French sent, just as the British had, the largest naval expedition in their history across the Atlantic to defeat the Africans. The Africans won. And in 1804, as a result of these victories, Haiti establishes the first republic to grow out of a successful slave revolt in the history of humanity. That's remarkable enough in and of itself, but there's something else that really needs to be emphasized here. And that is that Haiti, following this victory, becomes the first site of the complete and full um, expression and implementation of the most important value the most fundamental value of the Enlightenment, 
And that value of the enlightenment is that all people are created equal and that there can no longer be slaves and masters, that there cannot be classes of, of privilege or power based on race or identity questions. These ideas are enshrined in the Haitian constitution written by Africans in 1804, the first time in world history that these sorts of ideas had been enacted. We think of the enlightenment coming from Europe, but here we see its most cherished and fundamental value being implemented by Africans. Okay, so why is this important other than the, so the remarkable surface features of this uh, Haitian story, which you've heard so far? Um, Haiti uh, then sets, the events in Haiti then set in motion other world historical events of just uh, boundless dimension. The first of them is that um, uh, Napoleon, having been defeated a second time, has nearly ba bankrupted his nation. And, and as a result of his financial distress, is forced to sell France's territories in the continental United States, or at least in what is now the American, meaning United States of American part of con uh, the continental United States. These lands, which we know of as the Louisiana Purchase, constitute all or part of 15 present day American states. This sale, this panic sale by Napoleon to avoid bankruptcy doubles the size of the United States overnight doubles under the Thomas Jefferson administration. Some other things begin to happen though. American politics up until that point had been dominated by the, what is called the Old South, meaning especially Virginia, where so many of the founding fathers are from, but also places like South Carolina and North Carolina and Georgia, centers of plantation economy, meaning prison industrial labor economy. Um, and the, the fathers, so to speak, of these uh, young American states, meaning the white elites of these parts of the country are panicked by what they saw in Haiti. That if blacks could rise up in a place like Haiti and defeat the three great empires of the modern age in succession, and by the way, defeat again to repeat France twice, we can't afford to have them in this kind of concentration in our midst in the old South. And so this sets off a second great migration of people of African descent uh, um, in, in, in this era. The first of them is of course the transatlantic slave trade. And now we see huge movements by force uh, as people of African descent are sold out of the old South and marched typically by foot in some smaller cases by sea, but mostly marched across the vast expanse of the United States to the Mississippi Valley, where they are put to work in the next, in the successor miracle force in terms of the birth of the modern world. The first being sugar. I haven't really dwelled much on sugar in this talk in terms of its transformational effects. The book gets into this to a very deep extent. Um, but um, cotton in this industry becomes its successor. Uh, and we see the United States go in an extremely brief period of time. So what's remarkable about my narrative, I hope you will find, is that at each of these stages, we see gigantic leaps being taken in very compressed period of times. And so this is the last one that I'll discuss today, where cotton starts being grown for the first time with any real purpose or on any real scale in the early 1790s in the United States, starts off from a negligible amount um, by the early decades of the 19th century, the United States is already the world's leader in cotton production, uh, producing several million tons of cotton per year. Just prior to the Civil War in the United States, by that point, the United States is producing 2 billion tons of cotton per year. In other words, so from 1793 or thereabouts, the United States went from almost nothing to 2 billion in terms of cotton production. Cotton in this era is by a very long distance, the most important export by value of the United States. 
uh, the trade in cotton and the trade in the human beings who do the hard labor to produce the cotton in these prison industrial labor systems becomes the most important motive force in terms of the rise of American wealth in this era. It's not just the matter of the value of the cotton as big as it was. It's not just the matter of the value of the, the slaves as chattel property as big as that was. Banks and mor mortgages were premised very often on the value of the human beings that people, this was, this was the, 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 in other words, these were the, these, these uh, humans were prop, more mortgageable property in this era and constituted an enormous basis for finance in this booming era for the United States. But it's not just the, the, the sheer value of the cotton or the sheer worth of the human beings in this bustling trade of this era around cotton, but all of the secondary and subsidiary industries which grew out of it, transportation, insurance, finance, transportation, by the way, needs to be broken down. Railroads, entire railroad systems were built on the basis of the cotton trade. Investment was drawn from Britain and from Europe. Fortunes were made investing in the creation of railroads in this era, all of which were premised on, on this plantation production. Um, uh, trans, um, uh, canal systems were built on the basis of this production. Uh, fleets of transatlantic um, uh, ships for uh, the commerce and cotton were built on the basis of this production. But the most important thing that was built on the basis of this production is something that like most of the history we've discussed today ends up being recounted in the traditional narratives, virtually without reference to Africa. In fact, probably mo almost never with reference to Africa. And that is the industrial revolution itself. England rises in this period on the production of textiles. This is a story we are told is a story of European cleverness, of ingenious inventors and business people who discovered how to create vastly more productive processes, essentially grouping looms together in one place and management systems that could eke out much more productivity out of them and the birth of the modern factory, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things happen indeed. However, the way we tell this story leaves out the source of the basic material from which these textiles are, are, are produced. And that basic material was the product of Africans and the descendants of Africans brought across the Atlantic, then marched across the United States and put to work in systems of industrial prison industrial labor to eke productivity out of them at unprecedented rates and i fit I, I don't literally conclude my book on this note but toward the very end of my book i produce comparisons of the growth in productivity between the uh, industrial sector in england in this era built around textiles and the plantation sector in the united states built around the prison industrial labor camp system, and they were in lockstep. The lash whipping people of African descent and uh, surveilled systems of labor, increasingly tightly managed with increasing brutality, eked out productivity in lockstep, eked out growing productivity in lockstep with the rapidly growing productivity of the loom and of factories in the Lancashire style, uh, Lancashire region of Britain, where the, where the Industrial Revolution saw its heartland. So I think I'll conclude there and take a sip of water. Um, I hope I've left you with a lot to think about, uh, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Professor French. It's quite the tour de force through three or four or five hundred years of history, and there's indeed a, a lot to talk about and um, so the questions are now open for you in the q a box on the bottom of your screen if you want to post your questions there um, I, i'd like to begin with i think what is after i read your book one of the things that kept troubling me is you know how come this has been all of this rich story that you tell, how come it's all been written out of the conventional history books that we read and that children are taught when they go to school? Is it quite simply a sort of other version of the victor writes the history or is there something more complicated going on here? Could I just invite you to, to talk us through that as you see it, please? 
Sure. I think this is a tremendously important question. And I thank you for opening up the questions with this thought. Um, I don't have a fully settled answer to this, but I have my own gut answer to this. And my own gut answer to this goes like this. Um, human beings, wherever we find ourselves, like to find, like to found positive stories about our own successes. Every nation has its own national myth. Every culture and civilization has its own national or its own uh, myth formation where uh, virtue uh, and effort are highlighted uh, and stories are narrated on that basis to talk about how wonderful we are and why our success results from our own uh, special qualities, right? This is kind of a, a, a near universal feature of, of humanity. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's so, so that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin, and it's very much the other side of the same coin, is that in order to do this very normal human thing, which means to seek virtue in one's own story, to explain one's own circumstances and one's own success, one has to try to find ways of effacing what is less flattering from the story. And in the case of the narrative that I've told, the things that need effacing are not just not flattering, they are monstrous. They are um, uh, horrendous on uh, almost unspeakable scales. Like there are a few parallels in history with which to compare. So, you know, almost the only thing that I can think of and it's, I don't like to favor this comparison because the circumstances are so different. And I don't think it's, it's terribly productive to sort of a step to even flirt with the establishment of a hierarchy of suffering. But the only scale kind of thing that I can think of like this is the Holocaust, right? Um, remotely similar, right? Uh, and they're very different. But in terms of scale, that sort of begins to get you into the picture, right? And so it's hard to acknowledge horror on that scale and still sustain a really good idea of oneself. And since we as human beings all have, I think, this um, instinct to try to seek out and to embellish stories of virtue and, and, and um, you know, pluck and creativity and genius and, and sacrifice and, and, you know, all of the positive values that we can in explaining our own, our own histories, against that backdrop of horror, it requires us really to work very hard to suppress memory of the horror. And so with regard to the early parts of my story, so, so the latter parts of the story are very recent history, right? And so the industrial revolution is not talked about or not taught in Britain, I'm quite confident on the basis of, and by the way, British investors were, even though Britain was not trading in slaves in this era, British investors were very, very busy investing in the slaveholding American South and profiting hugely from it, right? So British people don't want to talk about how their rise was premised on this. They would like to talk about how clever their inventors were, right? That's just much easier to do um, in the, in emotionally, psychologically. But in the earlier parts of the story, meaning the 6th, 15th, 14th, 15th, 16th century, in order to sort of get this narrative of the birth of the modern world off the ground in ways that flatter Westerners, because Westerners, the whole idea of the West demands flattery. Westerners need to be flattered because every myth needs to be flattered. So in order to um, get this narrative off the ground in a way that flatters Westerners, in, uh, um, uh, requires pretending that Africa indeed was empty, that Africa was indeed never a place where anything important happened. Yes, it's true. You know, if we're forced to admit it, we engaged in slavery and that was really awful, but that was a long time ago. But asterisk, we all know that Africa never really did anything before. Or Africans weren't really part of the story or African achievement wasn't a feature of world history or Africans had nothing to do with anything important. 
Thank you. Uh, we have a, a number of questions coming in here, so we'll, we'll go to those in a moment. I was just reminded when you were talking that I used to teach in Britain for a long time, and what most students knew about Britain and the slave trade was that Britain abolished the slave trade. That's Absolutely. what they learned in school. Yeah. I wonder just quickly, uh, your reflections on, on what's happening now with the tearing down of statues of Colston, for example, in Britain and other symbols of slavery. Uh, do you think that's the beginning of, of turning this narrative, uh, or how do you see that? Well, let me answer you, you answer that question after responding to your uh, most recent previous comment, which was a very um, uh, important one for this audience to hear, right? So I'm actually working on the topic that you just mentioned, that Britain's sort of uh, acknowledged the history of slavery at the point where they stopped the trade in slaves, right? Um, Britain had been the world's biggest slave trading power for the previous 150 years, more than the rest of the European countries combined in the previous 150 years. And so that's quite an act of erasure to say that we should start discussing slavery from the point at which we here in Britain decided to get rid of slave trade, right? Uh, just that's like a, 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 a beautiful example of the phenomenon that I just described, of this human need to seek virtue in one's own story. There's something else actually that has to be said here. And that is even after Britain abolished slavery, or, or first of all, abolished slavery in its own territories and worked to abolish the slave trade more broadly, Britain then began very soon thereafter to institute forced labor in Africa. Forced labor in Africa, in colonial Africa, doesn't end until after World War II. It doesn't end in British colonies in Africa until after World War II, or in French ones, or in Belgian ones, or in Spanish ones, or in Portuguese ones, right? And so the, the degree of selectivity and what we decide to understand or remember is, 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 is phenomenal uh, in its power or in its extent. And so this notion of, is this pulling down of statues, um, uh, uh, does this signal a big change in, the, in, in our course, meaning uh, uh, here in the West in terms of understanding our history? Um, I'm a little tentative more, you know, I want to be quite tentative about reaching such a conclusion. I think it's important, this moment that we have, that we're made perhaps still in, but which began uh, here in the United States with the killing of George Floyd and with Black Lives Matter and with a kind of um, uh, a popular movement to, to redress uh, marginalization of, of people of African descent and of, and, and of history involving people of African descent, right? Um, but I don't think this you know, I, I, I want to believe that many of the things that I've said today, most of your audience, including probably quite learned people, a lot of it they didn't know, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't think that you're going to get, for, you know, you, we're going to take a leap and all of a sudden, you know, the light's <laughs> going to shine everywhere. I mean, I think, and I don't think it's going to happen of its own accord. So you know, it would be wrong to embrace a kind of complacent sense that, oh, look, we've done a lot in the last couple of years, we should feel great about it. Now, um, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and, and universities and students and peoples in the disciplines that you and I teach, uh, and in others that are among the people listening here, we've all got labor ahead of us to, 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 to shed light on a, a more balanced sense of, of, of the past. So I, I have two questions here that go directly to that, which is for pe from people who are teaching and say, uh, you know, how, how do you develop techniques to target uh, younger audiences in the educational system? What kind of tools and resources can we use? So I have about two questions that speak to that. You know, how, how do teachers at all levels and uh, go about bringing in this alternative or this other history into the sure. curricula? Sure. Well, I can speak to something I've tried to do in this book, and then I can speak in a sort of general way as advice. So what I've tried to do in this book is 
partly because I'm not trained as an academic historian. I don't say that with any apologies or, or kind of false bashfulness. I mean, I, I took on my topic deliberately and I worked hard at it, even though this isn't, you know, um, uh, necessarily the background that I come out of as a, as a discipline. Um, but I wrote this book to be, ex even though it's quite a long book, I wrote it to be accessible. Um, you know, I'm not trying to sell the book as I say what I'm about to say, but my book can be read by a junior high student could read my book. Um, you know, uh, and so I think part of the answer is writing about um, aspects of history that have been buried or effaced or, or distorted in ways that are on the one hand deeply documented and therefore not easy to knock down. There's no such thing as a definitive history that will stand forever and there's never another word to be said about it. That's not the goal here, but deeply documented and therefore withstanding, you know, anything but, uh, you know, it, withstanding scrutiny, right? Uh, and accessibility. So accessibility is, is the point here. You have to, we have to write, including those involved in academia, have to find ways to write about these topics in with, with a more attention toward accessibility, right? So that's one of the things. The other thing is, you know, I've been doing quite a lot of speaking on this book and, and I've been asked the question about as educators, how do we do this thing a lot, right? And my answer, one of piece of my answer is, you know, I don't, I don't spend a lot of energy, actually, I don't spend any energy trying to make anybody feel guilty about this stuff. That's not the point. I'm not calling out this or that group or saying you awful people or wagging my hand or that's not what this is about. I think we can all feel better by being honest about the past that we all emerge more noble by actually um, making a mental effort to come to terms with things as they actually happened as opposed to trying to fudge things or to pretend that things didn't happen. Right. And so, so, um, you know, um, I don't have any particular person in mind, but, you know, there are people who sort of use this to hold over other people and or to induce guilt. And I just don't think that's productive. I think the, the story itself is what's important and being accurate about the story is what's important. And that if, if you are accurate about the story and you're not, you know, wielding this as a kind of form of punishment for any particular audience, then they they'll come to it if they get a chance to, if they're exposed to it, they'll come to it. Um, and so I guess that's as best I can do. Uh, now, one of the questions here speak directly to that. And it kind of, it asks, uh, how do you, how do we use today's moral standards to, to judge the wrongs of the past? And, and I, I think that's what your questions, now your answer to the question hints at the difficulties of doing precisely that. Right. So I'm not, I don't think I'm set, made any moral judgment of anybody, right? I mean, I, first of all, I said uh, a few minutes ago, very clearly, a lot of this effacement or downplaying of horror, these are like normal, human beings do this, right? Like they look for their own virtue and they downplay the bad stuff that they did. I think this is, I want to humanize this. I don't mean to say we should say this wasn't horrible or we should like eliminate any sense of the true dimensions of the horror, right? But, but you also need to understand that this, the, 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 the hagiographic ways that history have been treated in the past are common, they're almost universal, right? And so I'm not making, I'm, I'm not really expending any effort making a moral judgment of people. I think it was morally bad to enslave people, but that didn't happen in my lifetime. And I'm not here to, that's not the, exact, you know, imposing a moral judgment of individuals about this is really not sort of front of brain for me. It's not a priority. It's like, we have enough work to do just establishing the record of what happened, right? Um, and once we've done that, then we can figure out what we want to make of it morally. But we're, we, 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 we're still digging out the record. So I, I have a question here from somebody who's joined us from uh, 
a university in Zambia, and he says he teaches, uh, his name is Ansitios, uh, he teaches uh, international relations at a local university in Zambia, and it's great to have somebody from Zambia with us. Uh, and he, he asks that he he's always struck by the sort of Western-centric, Eurocentric nature of the discipline of international relations. And he asks uh, how he can fit in your work on the history of, of Africa and making the modern world into uh, Africa's globalization, he says. And I have a similar question, which is also bringing your historical perspective up to the present and says, you know, there's a lot of what you say about Africa's exclusion from history also ex uh, extend to Africa's exclusion from contemporary transformations in, in world politics. So mm -hmm. I wrote two questions into one there for you to, to wrestle with. Well, that's quite a lot to wrestle with. Um, <laughs> I have to confess here that I don't have an answer to every question. And uh, I think these are excellent questions. Uh, and these are things that I'm wrestling with. So my book ends as the title says, at the Second World War. And my, I'm at work already on, on, on a next project. And the next project is bringing this book forward. And at the center of this next project is the question of decolonization. Uh, and part of the, so decolonization can mean different things. So, so most obviously it would mean political decolonization, how nations became in, independent uh, and how um, formal colonization ended in the world um, at a particular moment in history, for the most part, meaning from, you know, India in 1947 through most of Africa in the 1960s, right? Um, but there's a lot of decolonization still taking place, which doesn't involve formal decolonization. And this means a kind of what I hope this doesn't sound too fancy or obscure, but true democratization, which means involving peoples from outside of the recently traditional power centers of the world routinely into the conversations about, um, about our lives, about world affairs, about history, um, about politics, about international events, right? Um, and um, this, like uh, what I said about history and statue um, uh, iconoclasm earlier, is, is a struggle. Um, the West uh, is used to monopolizing, uh, like taking up all the oxygen in the room uh, in, in most discussions. And the West isn't going to stop doing that just out of, first of all, the West isn't doing that because it's evil per se. And the West isn't going to stop doing that because it's, you know, suddenly become enlightened and generous, right? This is going to involve a struggle and it's going to involve education and it involves reminding people that, for example, um, you know, the world looks one way today, but uh, history shows us the world can look very different in very short periods of time later. And the best example for the purposes of this question is there's 1.4 billion Africans in the world today. By 2050, there's probably going to be 2.5 billion Africans. And by the end of this century, we are told there may be between three and five billion Africans. That's twice the population of China, right? Um, almost all of the incremental growth in the human population over the rest of this century will come from Africa, right? Uh, you can be frightened by that. You can be bored by that. You can be thrilled by that. Um, but this is going to transform reality in ways that are complacent everyday sense of just walking around thinking about the world um, uh, doesn't doesn't accommodate doesn't allow for right and so it's time to get ready for thinking outside of the the comfortable familiar and understanding that uh, you know big change is coming whether you wish to accept it or not and so you have a choice as a thinking person as I think everyone in this audience surely is that you know do I try to do, do I try to engage the seeming unfamiliar now and try to anticipate change in a positive way or do I wait until it comes crashing over me and you know sweeps me away one one question maybe this will be our last question when you were talking now uh, what struck me one of many things that struck me when I read your book and now listening to you reflecting on on the contemporary situation is when you talk about um 
the slave trade and the ease, the seeming ease with which African leaders at the time sold um, other Africans into slavery. Uh, you, one of your explanations for that is that there wasn't yet at that time a common African identity. There wasn't a sense of a common Africanness mm -hmm. or blackness, if you like. And I think mm -hmm. now one of the important changes is that there is this much stronger sense of a unified Africa. And I wonder how you think that might play out uh, when you come to look at your, your, your looking forward to your next volume. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, so yes, there's a much like there's a incomparably stronger notion of what African means or of common identity and blackness now than there was say in the 17th century when the slave trade was at its height, right? Um, or, or 18th century. Um, and the audience, had not those of you who have not read my book probably don't understand the argument we're alluding to here, but Africans in, who were selling sl people into slavery in the period that your question is asking about, um, first of all, had no idea what purposes these people were going to be put to. They had not been taken on tours of the prison industrial labor camp system in the West to say, okay, we're taking these people for this purpose, right? They're selling human beings to unknown purposes to strangers who were taking them into a world that they would never see themselves, right? Um, and so there's that. Um, they also had no um, uh, way of identifying with the form of slavery that was being practiced by the Europeans. Africans, of course, had slavery, but it was not chattel slavery. It was not generational slavery. It was not racial slavery, right? So all of this was entirely unfamiliar to them. In more proper answer to your question, um, I should say that the business of an identity formation around Africanness is just beginning. That Africans were scattered to the four corners of the Atlantic and have, for the most part, this diaspora has been bound up in petty chauvinisms that have kept them from seeing themselves uh, as a common resource, uh, as a common, as having interests in common beyond national boundaries, and that this is really the next step that African-Americans have to get over their obsession with Americanness and see the African part of their hyphenated names much more prominently, and that Africans have to come over their African chauvinisms and to see their Americans much more as their brethren and Canadians and Europeans and Brazilians, et cetera, and that this is really the next step in identity formation and of synergy in terms of overcoming handicaps. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We got through a fair number of the questions and unfortunately we do have to end it. Uh, it's coming up to four o'clock. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Howard French. I I'll make sure to invite you back when the second volume is out and we'll continue the conversation. So thank you so much and thank you to everyone for, for joining us. Um, there are many more talks coming up at SIPS over the next few days. I believe we have one later this week on Yemen, possibly also one on the unfolding situation in Ukraine. So um, do check our website and our Twitter handle and please come back. And thank you to all for coming and thank you particularly to Howard French and goodbye for now. Thank you, Rita. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>